Hello and welcome to India Speak, the podcast by the Center for Policy Research. I'm Partha Mukhopadhyay, Senior Fellow at CPR. Today we shall be talking about the current situation in Sri Lanka. We'll take a slightly longer perspective to try and understand how the current situation has come into being, what are the necessary conditions for an orderly resolution, and the role that India could possibly play in facilitating that process. To discuss this, we have with us Professor Rohan Samarajiva, Chair of Learn Asia, one of Sri Lanka's most respected think tanks, and a commentator on policy issues who has listened to across the political spectrum. Welcome, Rohan. Happy to be here. For those who are not following the Sri Lanka situation on a day-to-day basis, could you give us a brief uh, roundup of how this current situation has come into being, uh, whether it is something that is related to the immediate crises of COVID in Ukraine, and if not, what are the other issues that have led to its uh, the current crisis that we see today? Okay, the immediate crisis from the perspective of the man on the street is that from December, November last year, December, I think, there's been a shortage of cooking gas, which affects the urban areas the most. Probably 70% of the people in the urban areas are using uh, LPG gas cylinders. Uh, so this situation has improved, has gone back, etc. cetera. From uh, about a month back, uh, or even more than that, we've had electricity uh, outages, load shedding. Uh, Sri Lanka, you must remember, isn't used to load shedding. We are used to more or less 24 hours of electricity. Um, and some of the load shedding got very bad, uh, seven hours, et cetera. Um, and it was not fairly applied. So they protected the MP's quarters and the president's, where the, pre- the area where the president lived and so on, which also caused anger. Uh, there's been uh, fuel shortages, diesel and petrol, um, which has affected the entire transportation system and everywhere in the country you have people lined up. So that is, the, that is how people feel the, the crisis. The crisis, however, was in the making for, I would say, about 70 years. In the period since independence, Sri Lanka has not run a primary surplus. Leaving aside um, loan payments and interest, uh, we have not covered our yearly expenses, expenditures, government expenditures, uh, from the revenues that the government has generated. So it has been like a permanent fiscal deficit. There have been only three exceptions, and one was in the 1950s, and the others were in the last two years of the previous government when Mr. Mangala Samaravira was the Minister of Finance. Uh, So you sort of begin to see that it's been a country that has been essentially living beyond its means, and uh, the cause of why it was living beyond the means. One cause is, uh, as Mr. Lee Kwan, you said, Sri Lanka is a country that engages in periodic auctions of non-existent resources. Um, in our language, we call it Porundu Deshpane, which is every, every political party comes up with various promises uh, and without much thought given to how these things can be funded. Uh, So that is on the expenditure side. On the revenue side, um, the the tax uh, take is one of the lowest in the world. Uh, 
and the immediate trigger for the pri uh, present tr crisis was that the tax reforms that were put in place in 19 uh, in 2018 uh, were rolled back in some extraordinary way where you know basically the taxpayers the numbers were reduced uh, by by one third i mean they were too small to start with but now suddenly one third of the people who were taxpayers didn't have to pay tax because the threshold went from um, five lakhs of Indian rupees to um, 30 lakhs Indian rupees. Uh, sorry, Sri Lanka rupees, not Indian rupees. So you can make the calculation. I mean, it was just a six-fold uh, raising of the threshold. Um, also, some insane things like, like uh, you know, pay not being applied, uh, pay as you earn and so on. The result was 25, the government lost 25% of its revenue. Now, this is December of 2019, uh, well before COVID comes or COVID has been thought about. Uh, Fitch lowers the credit rating uh, in January uh, um, to triple C, I believe. Uh, the government doesn't respond to that other than to issue news releases saying Fitch is unreasonable, et cetera. By April of 20, now we are into the COVID period, Sri Lanka is effectively shut out from the commercial debt market. Now, commercial debt market is important for a number of reasons. Back in uh, 2004, Sri Lanka's commercial loans were 2.55% of the total. By 2020, it was 53.8% of the total. So this is a big clump uh, of international sovereign bonds that we, are, we owe. And I would put in that category some of the, uh, what we call term uh, loans from uh, China. Uh, that's 2.2 billion um, US dollars in term loans. Um, so now what had happened was that in 2019, there were attempts by the previous governor and the previous finance minister to set in place a debt management agency to get some new legislation through, uh, a debt management strategy had been proposed, etc. except that the um, constitutional crisis in 2018 um, slowed things down, and we had basically a limping um, dysfunctional kind of governments in 2019 as a result of the constitutional crisis and then the bomb attacks in, uh, in April of 2019. So those things didn't get completed. But uh, Mr. Kumaraswamy had, uh, Dr. Kumaraswamy had actually got some additional uh, uh, bond issues done in 2019 knowing that the election was on the way uh, and there would be some turmoil and there would be some uh, essentially undisciplined uh, expenditures. So that allowed uh, a little bit of leeway for the government to carry on. Uh, but since no remedial measures were being taken uh, and now COVID comes and the economy tanks, three point something uh, contraction plus Tourism revenues go down, but tourism effects are in a way high, a bit overstated, because in a good year, tourism will yield about 4 billion US dollars. But that is not a net figure. Uh, in actual fact, uh, you have to have a significant amount of imports uh, in order to sustain tourism. So I think it's, uh, it's uh, maybe about half of that is, is what uh, the, the, the actual foreign exchange uh, yields are. So the long-term problem, just to give, just to summarize, uh, long-term problem, Sri Lanka has been uh, like a patient uh, with various, you know, debilitating uh, conditions, uh, diabetes perhaps. Um, we have uh, Western uh, or scientific uh, treatment methods being applied in 2017-18. Um, 
and the patient is improving, but not, not significantly, it still is in this because there have been these external shocks. Uh, now we have a new uh, dispensation and uh, they bring in, um, uh, well, I have some very colorful terms in my language, but they bring in uh, various, uh, you could say witch doctors and people like that, uh, which was the government's first, uh, first uh, treatment of response to COVID also was not uh, science-based uh, approaches, but various concoctions. So now they start administering the various concoctions, modern monetary theory, unlimited money printing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the patient goes into a coma, is now in the ICU, uh, and uh, various people advise uh, the, the government to get the real doctors back in the game. Uh, they keep postponing because uh, the, the witch doctors are assuring them that things are fine under control. Uh, and uh, when the patient is almost at death's door, uh, start, you start going back to the, to the, uh, the previous uh, medical team. Uh, that's where we are now. Uh, thank you, Rohan. Uh, but tell me something about, I'm sure people like you and others throughout this uh, period, and especially in the last few years, uh, after, as you said, the reversal of um, the uh, fiscal consolidation, uh, consolidation that seems to have happened in 2017 and uh, 18, with the primary uh, account going into a surplus uh, for the uh, for those two years, uh, there must have been a lot of commentary about this. Uh, what was it about the politics of Sri Lanka that uh, didn't make this into the decision-making process, uh, not just uh, from into uh, the people who won the 2019 elections, but did the opposition sort of hammer this issue continuously and nobody was listening and the people were not convinced? Uh, what was the... Um, political environment that made this kind of uh, profligate behavior possible? So Sri Lanka has got a, a very, uh, uh, our, elect our political system has got some very perverse characteristics. The perverse characteristic is that since 1994, when they had the parliamentary election before the presidential election, it has always been a case of having the presidential election getting political momentum and then having the parliamentary election. There's a gap between the two. It could be three months, etc. In 2020, because of COVID, this was a long gap. Now, what usually happens in this, in this gap is that there's excessive uh, handing out of goodies because they're basically buying the, buying the votes for the parliamentary election. So this is really extremely dysfunctional, having this gap between the two elections. So what happened was that in December, um, they were planning for an early election. Could have been uh, even, I think technically it was possible to have the election by uh, March, April of the following year. So they gave this stimulus, what they thought was a stimulus to the economy, which the previous government had also done, by the way, in 2015, and which a number of us criticized. But these guys gave that stimulus in, in, in December 2019. Uh, now, once COVID comes in, uh, the, the message is diluted, because by that time, uh, now I can distinctly recall uh, an incident. So as soon as COVID came in, um, a group of us uh, were assembled. It was called out of the box report. Um, the chairman of the group was uh, Dr. Indrajit Kumar Swami, the previous um, governor of the central bank. I was a member, there were several others. So and, and we, Dr. Kumar Swami is now the- uh, He's now the an advisor. Of the uh, the three wise men, uh, three yes, wise, uh, wise men been... and women. Yes. 
who have been uh, sort of appointed to deal with Kumar the, Swami, the, Dev, Devarajan, and uh, Kure. Yes, but they are advisors. Huh? They don't have any any actual decision making authority. So we took this report, and not only was the report produced very quickly within about a month, uh, but we took this report to the president, to the prime minister, and to the then head of the economic recovery task force or whatever, the guy who, the Rajapaksa, who later became the finance minister. I personally went for these meetings. So there, our first recommendation was go to the IMF, because we knew that there was this was a very vulnerable period because Indrajit had been showing the numbers, giving the speeches, saying that the payments were peaking in this time period. The ISB payments and generally all the debt payments were peaking from about 2018 to about 2022, 23. That was the worst period. So that is why uh, that had to be managed. There was very little uh, leeway and uh, we were fear, we felt that they were going out. But we must remember that with this message, it was not a very clear message because while that was the first recommendation, we were pushing hard also on uh, giving some assistance because we had a very long lockdown by that time. April last year, uh, April in 2020 was a terrible period, complete lockdown of, this, of the country. Uh, and the, um, there was no assistance being given right at the beginning to uh, people in the informal sector, the daily wage earners. So I can remember vehemently arguing on television that these people should be given something. And we did succeed in, in breaking through and they were given uh, inadequate amount uh, to get through the, the, the COVID period, uh, get through the lockdown period. So there we are saying, we don't care whether you print money or not. <laughs> get, don't let these people go hungry. So on the other side, we are saying, you know, get the, get the fiscal balance under, uh, the fiscal uh, deficit under control. So in a way, you could say that the messages were somewhat mixed during that period. Now, the most articulate spokesman, uh, the economic spokesman for the opposition is Dr. Harsha de Silva. He tends to talk about his speeches in 21 and so on. I think this particular report, uh, which was uh, handed over the out of the box report, which is still on the web somewhere, Pathfinder Foundation put it together, was perhaps the earliest uh, intervention. And, uh, but basically the, uh, what you're saying is that the government was able to use the COVID downturn as an excuse not to take the kind of longer term decisions that were necessary at that point in time? Well, I mean, the, 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 the recommendation that they were getting was go to the IMF because we need to get the, the debt under control. Uh, we weren't saying hire a law firm and start negotiating with the ISP holders at that point because it was still possible that we went to the IMF uh, and did certain things, and we would have been able to get the, um, the ratings back into uh, the right territory where uh, a few uh, even high priced uh, debt, a commercial debt could be taken. And that would help to even out and manage uh, the, the period ahead of us. But again, remember, you know, I mean, 2020 first half was a period when pretty much everybody was groping in the dark. I mean, we had some clues as to what we were doing, but everybody was, uh, was trying to find their way. What would the markets return? Was it a V-shaped return? Was it a long stretched out U-shaped uh, recovery? All these things were sort of up in the air. Uh, I've been looking back at some of the television interventions that I've made, and I don't seem to have made some made any enormous, outrageous mistakes. <laughs> but uh, I wouldn't have been surprised if there were a few. One other final thing because before we sort of move on from the history is all this borrowing that has been done over the years, how has it been spent? 
there's obviously, uh, you know, the large projects like uh, the Humbantota Port and the Katunayaka Expressway and the Colombo Port City. Uh, but uh, these are just the more marquee uh, investments. Uh, we have had similar investments like the uh, STDP uh, road uh, funded by the ADB and so on. So uh, what was this borrowing spent on and why is it the case that these expenditures have not produced a commensurate return? Well, um, I was looking through the numbers. These are actually some young economists have been putting out some very informative uh, compilations. Uh, perhaps if there's a possibility, some of those links can be provided uh, along with the podcast. But uh, I'll just give you a few examples. So the biggest uh, infrastructure project, I mean, in terms of infrastructure loans was, um, actually there were multiple, but I'm just taking the big one, which is uh, the Norochole coal generating plant, uh, electricity generating plant, Lakwijaya. The loan was from uh, the Exim Bank uh, of China, uh, US dollars 891 million on which we've been making payments since 2014. And the overall loan period is 20 years. So it had a five year um, uh, grace period. So 2009 will be paying till uh, 2029, but we've been making payments since 2014. The largest Indian loan for again for infrastructure, which was for a railroad project, was um, US dollars 416 million on which we've been making payments since 2015. And that's a 40 year um, loan, right? So I would assume that the annual or whatever the periodic obligations are, are lower. Now there's a whole series of this. Our biggest uh, most of the loans that we have taken have been from the ADB, Asian Development Bank. Um, that amounts to uh, 52, uh, 5,250.7 million uh, US dollars. Uh, China's comes below that. Uh, ISPs, on the other hand, are 13 billion. So now the question is, the ISBs, uh, they have these qualities, right? You get the money up front, you uh, have to repay it uh, in one lump sum, uh, the interest payments are in the middle and so on and so forth. Now, the ISBs don't have to be spent on projects or on meeting project milestones, unlike the infrastructure loans that we have incurred. So the ISB, business starts in 2007 in a big way. That is under the first Mahindra Rajapaksa administration. The war is going on on one side and uh, debts are coming due. Some of these uh, infrastructure payments have to be, uh, uh, loans have to be paid. So for example, the uh, IDA credit that I was involved in uh, in telecom reform from the 90s, late 90s. Now those things are coming due by now, even with long grace periods, right? So the ISBs were used to pay the loans on the infrastructure projects. Because recall the war is going on and the government revenues are going to fund the war. So that the war has an effect. Mr. Sumandiran in, in parliament says, you know, you got into this problem because you didn't keep your word and you had to fight um, Tamil youth. Uh, he, he says that it's not untrue, but it's not the whole story. Uh, so it's this piling up of all the debt obligations. And now remember, again, when I talk about uh, infrastructure loans, so they have to, to result in dollar earnings somewhere in the economy, 
not necessarily from that project because electricity is not, not sold abroad. So it doesn't directly generate uh, dollars or export earnings. Telecommunications, except for this little thing of roaming, uh, doesn't generate uh, export earnings, but it should it should improve the performance of the entire economy. We should be doing more exports. Now, it has been well documented that Sri Lanka has been performing poorly in terms of exports and that our performance has been going down over the years, not going up. So people were talking about foreign investment, but the investment was going into non-tradables, um, big uh, building projects and and things of that nature, telecommunications, uh, and so on. So unlike in, in Vietnam, where the investment was coming in and exports were going up at the same time, here, the investment was low, uh, but it wasn't actually yielding exports. So export diversification, export growth, et cetera, wasn't happening. So, um, and then of course you have the insane expenditures. Uh, a cricket stadium in Hambantota that nobody uses, a convention center in Hambantota, which is the Rajapaksa's uh, home area in the deep south, uh, that has been used maybe once under compulsion for the Commonwealth uh, meetings, uh, an airport that nobody uses, and, and so on. So there's a whole series of these, these things for which loans were undertaken, but which do not use uh, which do not generate revenues either in dollars or in rupees. In no form do they contribute to the economy. So there you have the, 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 you have the causes. Um, and uh, the repayments, as you said, uh, from the loans that were taken to fund these projects were done through sovereign borrowings uh, as and when the repayments came due. So even these sovereign borrowings were sort of um, pledging the country's uh, future um, foreign exchange revenues to fund the uh, debt repayments of past and productive projects? Well, I, I wouldn't say pledging because I mean, the, well, all they care about are the ratings, right? So, you know, we were not one of the, we were not getting 1% or 2% uh, interest rates. We were paying roughly 8% uh, on, this, uh, on these uh, ISBs, but we were able to get the ISBs and we were rolling them over. So if you look at the numbers, uh, when the Rajapaksas were not in power, um, when the Rajapaksas were not in power, um, under Ranil Vikramasinghe, they were still taking a uh, lot of loans. So that was how the Rajapaksas responded. Oh, why are you taking? Why are you increasing the loan stock? But this is how it was being rolled over. So as the, the payments come due, you take more loans, more ISPs, and you pay them and you settle them and you keep moving on. Now, only Indrajit Kumaraswamy had and Mangala Samaravira had some strategy of trying to handle this, trying to get this under control, because anybody can understand that you know, taking borrowing to, to repay your debts is not a long-term sustainable <laughs> strategy. Wonderful. Uh, and is uh, what you're saying then is fundamentally what we then uh, end up is a situation where none of these borrowings are actually growing to create productive assets, which can then generate revenues uh, to repay these kinds of loans uh, in the future. And I, and I uh, also noticed that the uh, interest rates on these loans start ticking up uh, in 2019. And then, as you said, that once the uh, downgrades happen, um, Sri Lanka shut out of this market and that strategy can no longer be deployed. Yeah, come on, we are out of that. that, that piece. I wouldn't say none of the money. Now you look, I mean, uh, just give you an example, right? Uh, from 2002, when Sri Lanka suffered extraordinarily uh, nasty power uh, load shedding in the electricity sector, I think we had the maximum was 14 hours a day, uh, there has been a shift in thinking which says giving people reliable electricity, uh, not giving people reliable electricity is the cost. It's not the cost of providing electricity, but the cost to the economy of not providing them with electricity. So when you take people working from home, when you take uh, 
the uh, software and B, uh, BPM industry, which is supposed to be pr producing about 1 billion US dollars in earnings or tourism, uh, keeping the basic infrastructure performing is necessary. It's a necessary condition for uh, them actually doing what they're supposed to do, which is you know create jobs and create exports and bring in the dollars. Now, you don't do that. You can't do that without the coal plant. You can't do that without uh, some of the infrastructure inf investments that have been incurred. So we can argue about the, the we can argue that the Colum the airport to Colombo uh, expressway is was a necessary and important expenditure that was worth taking taking loans for. Uh, when I was talking to the people from the ADB and so on, they were saying, you know, that's the only viable thing. You guys don't have anything else that's viable uh, in, in, uh, for, a P, for a PPP, for a build, operate, transfer kind of model. So we, we didn't do that. We, we spent it all and we are getting operation, covering operational costs from a toll. Now, one could argue also that the Southern uh, Highway, which was the first expressway to be built, serves the tourist industry and therefore it has certain benefits and so on. But we can't say the same thing about this cricket stadium that was built or the airport that planes do not come to or a tower in Colombo that serves no purpose other than as an advertising symbol for the Rajapaksas and so on and so forth. So there's a whole lot of unproductive investments. But I wouldn't say all. That's uh, thank you, Rod. Uh, I stand corrected. Now, what um, going forward? Do you see the economic crisis being solved or addressed reasonably without the political impasse being broken? Because, uh, or do you see that with some kind of uh, supplies flowing in from? Uh, lines of credit from different countries which provide, let us say, food, milk, cooking oil, fuel, medicines, etc. The immediate anger of the people will sort of dissipate and the president will be able, with this kind of expert council that he has, uh, of advisors that he has appointed, to sort of muddle through. Uh, the process, or do you see the uh, political contestation being a significant roadblock to the economic resolution? We are in new and unknown territory. We don't really know the answers. The issue is that uh, yesterday, uh, the Ministry of Finance put out a notice saying that uh, we, have, we are no longer, there's a moratorium on uh, loan repayments. Now, the Indian press ran the story as default, but I don't think that it's, uh, it's actually technically correct. Uh, it's a payment moratorium, which says we, are, we have initiated uh, discussions with IMF and we are dealing with all the debtors. We intend to repay them. In the meantime, you can take the standard uh, interest rate that was applicable to your particular, those particular transactions, and uh, you can capitalize it because we will pay you back. Uh, if you want your money back in rupees, we are happy to provide it and here's who to contact. So now we are on the, I mean, this is a debt standstill, right? Which means that instead of the earlier strategy of scraping together and expropriating money from everybody, including exporters um, at unreasonable exchange rates and so on and so forth. Uh, every month on the seventh of the month, you know, 50% or all, all your foreign earnings had to be converted into rupees, uh, even if you had to make payments. So those kinds of, ex those kinds of behaviors stopped people from bringing money into the country. So there's a lot of money floating around all over the world's banks that is not coming because of the government's uh, actions. So even that has been reduced. Now, there was a 50% uh, compulsory uh, uh, requirement. Now it's gone down to 25 and so on. 
So uh, one could argue that the economic processes are sort of underway. Debt stands still, uh, lawyers being recruited for the negotiation with the ISBs, uh, IMF discussions, et cetera, et cetera. However, for all these, you need a stable, credible government on the other side to negotiate. You need a stable, credible party on Sri Lanka's side. We don't have that. Now, I think the younger generation has realized uh, that the, their hopes uh, have been shattered for a decade and maybe forever that they will not live a better life than their parents. It's that anger that is yielding the political demand of go to go home. That is get rid of the Rajapak, get rid of the president. He's got to go. Uh, the Rajapaksa has got to go uh, and uh, associated demands. And some of the anger is being directed towards parliament as well. And yesterday, there were some reports that they are now beginning to say, who are the corporate leaders who are behind all this? And they need to be held, made accountable too. So it's spreading. Now, this Occupy business has been going on for four days. Um, the game has changed radically. So, for example, the organization that I've been uh, working with, uh, which is headed by the previous speaker, former speaker, Mr. Karuja Surya, uh, the National Movement for Social Justice, which played a very instrumental role in that 2015 uh, common candidate being uh, being selected and uh, the government uh, changing against many people's expectations. We have been arguing that the 20th Amendment of to the Constitution, which concentrated all power in the presidency and disempowered uh, parliament, uh, has to be removed. Now that's almost a universally uh, accepted policy. We, to, it's to our great shock. Those days we were the only people arguing for it. Uh, two months ago, we didn't have much support. And <laughs> now we've got, now we think we can even assemble two thirds majority in parliament for that because even people inside the government are supporting it uh, <laughs> to, to, to clip the wings of the, the president. So um, the uh, there was some talk of a quick general election, but that's kind of been pushed back. Now the conversation is about when the election will be held. Will it be six months from now, one year from now, two years from now? Right. So that means that we have to have a working uh, interim uh, cabinet of some sort, which will probably have to be from all the political parties, uh, national government, so to speak which uh, well, I personally have been pushing from uh, November of last year, but there wasn't much traction for it. And I actually took the language out from some of the documents that I was responsible for because they were collectively, uh, collective documents. They, I took the national government out, but it's really back on the agenda now. Uh, and uh, a common minimum program. Uh, there are many proposals for a common minimum program. There are some proposals about getting rid of the, uh, replacing the, who, what do we call them? The national list MPs. We have 29 appointed MPs, the people with expertise, etc. And there's a view that these people are no good and they have to be replaced by true experts who can form the cabinet. Now there's a lot of debate going on that I'm about that. I'm not thinking that's very realistic, but anyway, uh, political equation is extremely important. Without the political in, uh, changes, I don't think the occupiers are going away. Uh, I don't think uh, the debtors are going to be satisfied. There is no way that Mr. Rajapaksa can muddle through. So um, in that sense, and do you see, uh, for example, uh, in the immediate future, in both uh, uh, Dr. Indrajit Kumar Swami and Dr. Shanta Dev Rajan, two of the three members of this group that has been constituted to advise the government on uh, managing its external liabilities, uh, seem to indicate that uh, there would be some need for some kind of bridge financing. Uh, 
uh, over the next six to 12 months. Um, is that something about which there is a uh, discussion within uh, Sri Lanka um, or uh, is this um, with um, uh, something that the uh, press and the commentators are talking about as to how this could possibly be arranged? Obviously, um, um, the big uh, loan repayment on the sovereign bonds was due in July, but I see that uh, there must be about almost uh, three to four hundred dollars of repayments of the Sri Lanka development bonds, um, which are due um, mostly in May. Uh, are the holders of the Sri Lanka development bonds uh, different uh, from those who are uh, holding the international sovereign uh, borrowings? And can the government therefore negotiate more easily with the SLDB holders? Uh, while the bridge financing, etc., is being organized? Uh, the bridge financing conversation is not really big in the media, etc., but it is being talked about in meetings and so on. So I assume uh, if Indrajit has put out some, he's been reported on these lines, it will catch. Uh, there are talks that the Japanese could help or the Chinese could do something. The Indian uh, lifeline that came in uh, February or January was extremely helpful and things would have gone south <laughs> if not for the, <laughs> that Indian intervention. Uh, but the Indian money also came in the form of, you know, I mean, very specific uh, lines of credit. Uh, the Chinese money came in Yuan, uh, the earlier Chinese money. So, you know, is it is what we need in terms of bridge financing, that kind of tied money, or is there something uh, with a little bit more flexibility is on the, in the discussion. Uh, the idea is that you see the bottom line is that we got to get the economy functioning again and the exports flowing again, because, you know, people are just having to break contracts because, you know, they can't transport things from one place to another or they can't actually work. They are supposed to work from home, but they can't work from home. They go to the office and the office has got a generator, but the generator doesn't have diesel. So we are, we are going into, a, you know, back in November, uh, I was actually attacked by the government, uh, whatever, apologists for being a Cassandra. And I said, well, I mean, I'll take that label anytime because Cassandra was a truth teller. And it's only that she was cursed in not being believed. And I said, Lebanon, Lebanon, guys, look at Lebanon. That was my, my, my cry was, here's what's happening in Lebanon. And what's happening in Lebanon, what happened in Lebanon uh, back in 2021 20, is happening here now, right? Um, just recent, just two days ago, I was in a line and just, you know, to get petrol to my, for my car. And I'm like two cars away and they run out of petrol. So I had to go home. And so on. This goes on. So that is the conversation that is going on. Um, how do we get the economy functioning again? Now the rains have come, which is no credit to the government, and the reservoirs are filling. So we are going to be able to um, carry through on the on the electricity front. But we'll still need to buy the uh, coal plant is in in trouble because the actual purchases had to be done. Uh, earlier and because of the weather conditions on the on the west coast we don't uh, unload coal after april so since the full consignment wasn't unloaded uh, by this month i think we have only a tiny little window when we can unload so the coal plant will not be running at full capacity from uh, about june so all these things are happening. Good things are happening, which is the reservoirs filling with water. The bad things are happening. The coal plant not having adequate coal and so on. Um, so bridge finance, yes, uh, we do need bridge finance. And another thing that uh, Shanta had said, it was very interesting that, you know, I've been running uh, uh, webinars uh, with 
various experts. We ran 78 of them so far uh, from uh, November or December of 2020. And Shanta uh, was also on one of my webinars and we were talking about uh, the social safety net. So one of the things that we've been pushing very hard um, because we are also in conversation with trade unions and so on is that there will be safeguards that this is not the old big bad IMF that this is a new uh, new redesigned kinder gentler IMF and that they are okay with uh, social safety nets and Shanta is very committed to that um, so it's uh, one of the issues that we have been pushing very hard and there are several other organizations that are pushing very hard and luckily we have an ongoing 75 million US dollar project on social safety nets from the World Bank, which this government had kind of put into suspension, i.e. they were not really pushing it, but it can be activated anytime to consolidate the various welfare schemes and then to put money into people's accounts directly because 80% of Sri Lankans have bank accounts. And uh, instead of doing it in complicated and politically influenced ways, how can we have a flexible variable amounts being put in, depending on how uh, the oil prices move, oil electricity prices move, because all these have to go up in price. But do you see this um, cash transfer being able to compensate for the kind of inflation that you're seeing now? Or do you think more in-kind support might be needed? Nothing in-kind. In-kind is, uh, is, is absolutely corrupt in this country. Uh, and the old old uh, politi popols love uh, in kind. I, I will oppose it uh, as much as I can. Uh, and we don't have a, the proper mechanisms to, to deliver it either. So, so you think it's possible because we're, we're looking apparently at double digit monthly rates in, of increase in food prices. Sure, sure. So the issue is, you see, um, Sri Lanka is the most, uh, the country with the highest income inequality in all of South Asia. We are slightly above China uh, and slightly below uh, the US in, uh, in global terms. Uh, so that means that our bottom is hurting really bad. So targeted uh, now Samurdi, uh, which is the big, bad, big and dysfunctional uh, welfare scheme that we have, it's targeting is off, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but it covers about an uh, enormous number of households, maybe 40% of the households. So my recommendation is that we use Samurdi as a start. Uh, and then while the money is flowing, uh, start uh, looking at the targeting and stop it from being used for political purposes. Um, so what I expect is that those who are outside the welfare schemes, what we used to call the near poor. I mean, the near poor were actually covered by, by Samurdi. Uh, the near poor have already been pushed down into the, to the, into the poor category. It's the middle class that's going to get hammered because they won't be getting in this compensation. They will be paying more for petrol, more for electricity, more for drinking water, more for everything and for food. Um, and as we all know, um, that is where most of the political instability and the resistance comes from. So, yeah, I don't know whether we have a real solution for, for that. Um, but, you know, uh, we have been pushed to a situation where all the, as we say, you know, all the medicines that have been taken are unpleasant. Um, we have to try to see what is the least unpleasant medicine. And uh, given the delays, the unconscionable, I mean, I can draft a impeachment motion simply on the delays, on the dis delays in taking decisions, waiting till the last minute, what they did with COVID, what they did with, uh, with the economy, everything. They waited until the last minute. They tried every unscientific, illogical method before getting to the right method. So uh, that's where we are now. We'll have to pay a price. This is, we are living in a Lebanon scenario. There's no ifs and buts about it. Everybody's living standards are going down. 
And, but Rohan, do you think that as a result of this, uh, if one looks forward, uh, one is willing to take very bitter medicine if the chance of getting cured seems reasonably high? So do you see, you mentioned right at the beginning that this is a problem that was almost 70 years in the making in a particular way. Uh, do you see that this might be a moment similar to that of 91 in India, which would actually pivot the Sri Lankan economy uh, onto a path which can realize its undoubted potential? Or uh, do you see this as something that would, otherwise you're saying imploding into a sort of failed state kind of situation? I mean, um, given your understanding of the resilience of the Sri Lankan uh, population and the political establishment, the population itself seems to have been quite, um, you know, shall we say, mature and disciplined in its uh, protests. Yeah, the protests have been absolutely peaceful. There's been no violence, despite what the stupid New York yeah. Times said today. There's nobody fighting anybody on the streets. There's been no, no violence, no deaths so far, inshallah. Right? Uh, only people dying in, waiting in line for fuel. Eight people have died so far, just waiting in line. But no violence. We believe that if we can get away from this, what we call Porondu Deshwane, this promises based, giving away goodies that we don't have based politics, uh, the country has hope. And that conversation is coming up in, from several quarters. Is it widespread? Is it that uh, people who actually do politics for a living believe that? I have seen some of the political parties come up with that, uh, not <laughs> I wouldn't say parties, factions, come up with that in their documents, but mostly it's people like us outside the direct political fray. Um, and then I think the other thing, of course, that we are going for is that if we can get this sort of common minimum program that parties sign up to, parties and civil society signs up to, we will possibly have an end to the when in opposition protest X, when in government do the same damn thing, hypocrisy that afflicts our politicians. So that's why we have things like, you know, selling off this airline of ours, Sri Lankan, uh, as a uh, dominant element of our proposals. Uh, Air India was supposed to be losing 3 million US dollars a day. We were we are losing, even though it's a much smaller country and far fewer planes, we were losing half a million US dollars a day. Uh, so get rid of this albatross uh, and things like that, right? So we are putting things like that in. We are putting things like um, increase uh, the use of renewables in the uh, in our energy mix, and in order to do that, uh, enhance our uh, transmission grid because it's a patchwork uh, mess, and connect it to 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 the Indian grid, uh, so that we can push some of the excess uh, wind and solar over to the other side when necessary, and we can take from the Indian side when necessary and things of that nature. So those can be extraordinarily controversial, but if we can use this opportunity of a potential national government, uh, all party or multi-party government to get some of these hard decisions done, reforming the, the state sector is going to be the absolute key because we cannot recover with a dysfunctional uh, public administrative structure. And if we can get that done, that's an extraordinarily difficult thing to do because the Sri Lankan uh, state has basically stopped functioning, which is why uh, the President Rajapaksa was able to do all these mad things. Uh, so, yeah, uh, we live in hope. Uh, I always live in hope. Uh, we believe that this crisis 
is also an opportunity. Uh, but again, um, we don't really know what the outcome will be. Will we have a national government? Will we have the, I mean, it all depends on the street. If the, the um, people who are protesting on the street are defeated, probably we'll go back to, where, to the old way of doing things. And we'll settle down into a very low growth, low expectations, no hope, equilibrium. Uh, finally, Rohan, where, how do you see India's role in the immediate past? And what do you think India could do to facilitate a orderly resolution of the current crisis? Is it doing enough at this point in time? Uh, you must remember there's a lot of Indophobia in this country. Mm -hmm. So I think India being too intrusive doesn't help. I think India is appreciated. Um, the, 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 the form of the assistance in terms of fuel, in terms of uh, the lines of credit, etc. These are going to be exhausted by the end of this month, by the way. Um, <laughs> um, so um, I believe uh, Indian, I, I don't think anybody should give the Rajapaksas or the current government sort of loose cash. Um, it should be tied to certain things because I think giving them loose cash is a very dangerous thing. Uh, I think that's uh, what uh, needs to be done. I think India should, uh, should be steadfast in its commitment to the 13th Amendment uh, and uh, devolution of power because we can't forget uh, the needs of uh, the North and the East uh, in this country and we can't forget the, the needs of um, the uh, Tamil people of uh, Indian origin, of recent Indian origin who are our citizens who are working in the plantation uh, areas. Uh, we need to make sure they are not forgotten in the rush. Uh, and I think India can, can uh, play a good role uh, in that regard, uh, just keeping those issues alive and not letting them be, be subordinated to other priorities. But won't that sort of uh, tie India to a particular group or a section of the population in Sri Lanka and uh, yeah, but you see, now you see the difference. So uh, India's assistance has not been targeted to the north or the east. Or, so when, when India bombed us with uh, dal and food back in 1987 and infringed our sovereignty, uh, that was food for the north, for Jaffna. It was not for the country. Now it's fuel and food for the whole country. So that is good. Now, Mr. Stalin had said that from Tamil Nadu, he's willing to send food and medical assistance for the Tamil people of Sri Lanka. And uh, Mr. Suwandiran, the spokesman of the parliamentary opposition and guys from the street, that is uh, one young man who, who I happen to know, who is uh, one of the leaders or whatever of the street press. They both uh, went to the press and said, no, we don't need anything sold for the Tamils. So, And uh, what about the other flip side? Do you think that an Indian sort of bailout, bridge financing, etc., would sort of increase the chances or decrease the chances of the kind of radical reforms that you thought were necessary? No, now we are actually looking at a situation where people are going to begin to die in the government hospitals. I would say, I would say within the next few days, because they are running short of supplies. So bridge financing is necessary. You see, bridge financing cannot put out the fire. Uh, people, just because there's medicine coming in, just because the electricity doesn't get shut off, the street is not going to go back. These are 
these are young people who are protesting something bigger than electricity cuts that was the trigger but they are protesting the destruction of their dreams thank you rohan on that note hopefully sri lanka's dreams will continue to flourish and uh, it'll attain the kind of potential that that country we always know has had and whatever my experience has been with uh, sri lanka it's quite is there being to contemplate what might be happening in the streets and in the villages and in the local governments uh, of these places where i'm sure now will be called upon to do much more uh, in assuaging the kind of uh, support that you said would be needed for the bottom half of the population uh thank you very much and uh, good luck with uh everything going forward thank you to all our listeners on india speak thank you for tuning in for more information on our work follow us on twitter at cpr_india and log on to our website at www.cprindia.org